insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 38 grief and loss. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and inspiring co-host, Madison Whalen. Hello, How everyone. are you doing today, Maddie? Pretty good, sort of. Sort of. What's wrong today? My bottom teeth hurt. Why do they hurt? Yesterday I had an orthodontist appointment, and my bottom teeth are pretty sensitive. Your, uh, your monthly torture session at the orthodontist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh. tough. Um, so this week we are talking grief and loss, uh, just a little background on this one. Uh, this actually was a concept that we had come up with a few months back, right? Yeah. After our pets podcast. Yeah. You had a, a friend of yours, uh, was goldfish, their goldfish passed away. Well, like they had bought four fish and then four and within four hours of taking care of them, they all died. Right. Yeah. So, and, you know, that is a form of grief and loss. And uh, we'll talk about what grief is. We'll talk about the stages of grief, dealing with it, and all the wonderful things that we generally discuss on the podcast. And uh, it applies to more than just goldfish, though, right? Yeah. So, ready to get into it? Yep. All right. Let's do it. So what is grief? According to the Mayo Clinic, grief is a strong, sometimes overwhelming emotion for people, regardless of whether their sadness stems from the loss of a loved one or from a, term, uh, from a terminal diagnosis they or someone they love have received. Uh, they might find themselves feeling numb and removed from daily life, unable to carry on with regular duties while saddled with their sense of loss. Grief is the natural reaction to loss. Grief is both a universal and a personal experience. Individual experiences of grief vary and are influenced by the nature of the loss. Some examples of loss include the death of a loved one, the ending of an important relationship, job loss, Loss through theft or loss through independence through disability. Expert, uh, experts advise those grieving to realize they can't control the process and to prepare for varying stages of grief. Understanding why they're suffering can help, as can talking to others and trying to resolve issues that cause significant emotional pain, such as feeling guilty for a loved one's death. Mourning can last for months or years. Generally, pain is tempered as time passes and as the, the bereaved adapts to life without the loved one, to the news of the terminal diagnosis, or to the realization that someone they love may die. So that's a, that's a pretty big definition there. What do you think of, of everything there? I definitely think it can sum up grief in a very dignified and sophisticated way, and it definitely sums it up as best as it can, because grief isn't just like one sentence. Grief is like basically a whole thing that you have to think about. Like, yeah. not only do you have grief of like a loved one who had died, but you can also have other types of grief, like griefs of if a if one of your pets has died, or if you lose a loved one, like if they get lost, like if your child get lo gets lost on Space Mountain. <laughs> there is that, yeah. We still have painful <laughs> memories of that. Yep. So tell me, have you experienced 
loss? Yes, I have, sadly. Can you give us an example? I can definitely say um, the biggest loss that I can remember is the loss of um, our cat Fluffer that happened a few years ago. Yeah, that you uh, you were pretty shaken by that. How old were you when that happened? I think I was in. I think I was starting second grade. I think it was during the summer when I was in first. I can actually remember the morning quite well. I can, I can actually remember the day it happened quite well. Yeah. And it's just sad for me to think about it. Yeah. And and it wasn't a sudden loss. She was, you know, she was up there in years and she was getting, you know, infirmed and she was rather frail. Um, and the day that it happened, we had had the vet over because she had, I don't know if she'd had a stroke or something along those lines, but she was visibly shaken and she was, had labored breathing and we kind of knew the, the end was near and we didn't want her to suffer anymore. And we had the vet come over and the vet gave her an injection and it calmed her down and, you know, she passed quietly in, in mommy's arms. Um, and you know, we lost her. You'd had her since you were, you know, before you were born, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I can see now it's, it still makes you sad at, at the loss. And it's tough with pets because, you know, unless you own an elephant, your pet's probably going to die before you do. You know, the average lifespan for, for cats and dogs is somewhere in the 15 to 16 year range, human year range. Um, so chances are if you're a fan of pets, as mommy is, you're going to lose a few pets during your lifetime. You know, I had a, I had a dog when I was your age and, and when my dog died, it had an impact on me cause I grew up with my dog and, um, uh, you know, I didn't get another pet for 20 years cause I didn't want to go through that again. And then, you know, I was happened to be, I wasn't with mommy at the time and I was with someone else and we got a dog and the dog wasn't a fit for the family. We wound up returning him to the, um, store that we got him from. And then I didn't get another pet until, uh, we wound up getting Dorothy, one of our current cats. And, you know, in the event that she winds up passing away someday, I'm sure it's going to have that same kind of effect on me. Besides pets, have you experienced any other kinds of losses? Well, I know... Um, I know of my, um, the last grand, the last, uh, blood-related grandparent I had passed away when I was around seven. Yeah, yeah, Grammy. Yeah, um, I never knew any of my grandfathers, which is a pretty sad thing to think about, because they all, they both died before I was born. Um, I did have both my grandmothers, though, unfortunately... My grandmother on your side of the family died when I was like a baby, yeah. but at least she was able to see me. That is true. And Grammy lasted a few years with me and passed away when I was about seven. Yeah. It's tough. Any kind of loss is tough. So one of the things that um, <clears throat> people tend to adhere to when it comes to grief and loss is the stages of grief. And depending on who you use for a source, there's different number of stages. Um, the source that we're going to use today, there's seven stages. So let's move on to that. If okay, and um, we'll go over the stages, and I'll and I'll use my represent my uses of loss and see if I've has suffered those um su um stages of grief. That's the general idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for thanks for picking that up. For I just me. wanted to make sure. Okay. Shall we do that now? Yes. Okay. So healthline.com uh, lists the seven stages of grief. And the first stage that they talk about is shock and denial. This is a state of disbelief and numbed feelings. Uh, in the event of a death of a loved one, the reaction is typically they're not gone. They'll come around the corner at any second now. Like you don't, you don't realize that they're not going to be there tomorrow. Is that 
kind of how you felt when you experienced your most recent loss? Um, with Fluffo's death, yes. Like, um, I can remember the morning, my, like, I was getting ready to go to, I think, my summer camp at the time. I think I was actually going to DSC at the time, mm -hmm. and, um, Mommy had offered to make me breakfast. It started off as a good day, and then we found, we walked into the kitchen and found Fluffo on the floor. Mommy was shocked. Yeah. And I was like, I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was only like, what, like, around the age, around like seven, like, at the same time. Yeah, it's hard. To, it, it, it's a tough age, you know, to, to really understand these types of things at that age. Yeah, like, I was standing there. I heard mommy shocked, and for a few moments, I didn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, she hadn't passed away at that point in time. She was just, that was when we kind of knew she was very sick. Yeah, like, I just, like, saw Mommy worry, and I didn't really believe it. Like, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't believe what I was seeing. So the next uh, stage of grief that they talk about is pain and guilt. You may feel that the loss is unbearable, and that you're making other people's lives harder because of your feelings and needs. Did you ever feel, you know, if we want to stick with the example of Fluffer or Grammy or someone else, did you ever feel as though your emotional needs were having a negative impact on, on someone else at the time where your grieving was, was having a, an impact on the situation beyond the obvious immediacy of it? I mean... The day Fluffer died, or was put down, I didn't really think it through because the emotions were just thrown through my head. Right. And that's the thing. But, At the time, you really don't have a lot of time to think about that stuff. It sort of overwhelms you like a wave. Yeah, but I remember one day completely breaking down. Yeah. Well, I remember the next day when you went to school, um... You had cried in the morning about it, and then... No, it was actually a couple of days. Like, I wasn't in school, I know that. Well, like, not school, but, like, the next the next day that, that you were going to, I guess it was camp at the time, and I was dropping you off, you had cried that morning um, on the way to camp, and uh, you just sort of kept to yourself the, the next, that whole day there. And uh, you were very quiet for the next couple of days after that, where it was just sort of sinking in. Yeah. So from my perspective, and I, and I think mommy would agree, that you weren't a burden of, by any sort. Like there wasn't, there wasn't an outpouring of a need to console you during the process. Although, you know, we, we certainly, yeah, but we sat down and we had our, our good cries about it. Yeah, but I do remember. One day when I did, was in school, when I just completely broke down over it. Yeah. I couldn't stop thinking about her, and I literally, like, couldn't do my schoolwork, and I was just, couldn't stop crying, like. <laughs> kind of like now. Yeah, by the end of the day, so this was I did calm down. But probably like, not the best topic we probably could have talked about today, huh? Sorry. That's Okay. I mean, I knew I was going to cry during this one. That's, we should have brought tissues. We didn't bring any tissues in. <laughs> so so the next thing that we had on the uh, tug at my heartstrings hit list here was <laughs> anger and bargaining. Uh, you may lash out, tell God or a higher power that you'll do anything they ask if they'll only grant you relief from these feelings. Uh, the example they give... And the death of a loved one is if, uh, you know, if she cared more for herself, this wouldn't have happened, et cetera, et cetera. So did you ever reach that point? Because I know we're not particularly religious. religious, right? So we, there's not a lot of times that, that we tend to turn to prayer for things like that. Um, did you feel yourself trying to... to 
bargain for for a few more moments or did you feel anger at her her passing or anything i don't think i ever really felt anger but i definitely like remember just saying i just wanted her to be back alive yeah i remember always thinking that and sometimes even saying it when i would walk to her grave yeah well and you know in hindsight when we when she did pass we had a little service, um, non-denominational service, since we're not that religious. Uh, we had a little service. We buried her in the yard, and then Mommy decided she was going to plant a rose bush over her. And that rose bush is now growing uncontrollably <laughs> and encroaching on the deck now, making it very difficult to get up the steps to the deck. So, in a way, she sort of does live on in that rose bush, doesn't she? Yeah, and I remember Mommy saying the reason why we were using the rose bush was because the thorns would represent her claws or something. Yes, and she always clawed Daddy. <laughs> so the rose bush always scratches me when I walk past it, so it works perfect. So the next thing that we have in the seven stages of guilt here is stage four, which is depression. This may be a period of isolation and loneliness during which you perceive, you process and reflect on the loss. Um, I'm actually gonna gonna sort of usurp this one myself. Okay. When when my mom passed away, your grandmother, um, I was very depressed about it, and from an isolation standpoint, um. There was a period of about seven years or so where I didn't process it. And I kind of shut, slowly but surely, shut everyone down around me that loved me. And it was because I was not processing the death very well. Um, I was the person at the time who was the decision maker. It was, it was me and my three brothers, my three brothers and I. And my, in her will, my mother had wanted me, had declared that I was going to be the executor of the will. And to complicate things, uh, two of my three brothers I didn't get along with very well. So having me be the executor probably wasn't the best idea you know, from a stability standpoint. So we had, I decided to have my older brother be the executor of my will, of her will. And she, my mom, uh, had a living will. Well, didn't have a living will, but she had expressed her concerns. Now to a living will is a document that you draw up. It's not like a, a will is who gets my stuff when I die? What happens to my stuff when I die? And a living will is if I'm incapacitated and cannot make decisions for myself for any reason. Don't revive me if I need to be on a machine or a ventilator or something like that. Um, and basically it's, it's what to do if I can't make those decisions. And my mom never had one of those officially drawn up, but she was in a condition, she was in a vegetative state due to an illness where she was still alive on a ventilator and the machine was keeping her alive and we had to make a decision because it didn't look like she was coming out of it. And if she did, she probably would not have been herself because of, of brain damage that she had sustained. So the, the hospital had asked for a um, decision from the family and because I was listed on the will as the executor of the will, you can wipe your nose. Um, uh, I was listed as the executor. So I was the one who legally was responsible for making the call. So we all sat around the table, which ironically enough was the first time I had sat with my brothers in about five years and seen them. And they didn't know what to do. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to make the decision. And I told them, I said, well, you know, mom and I sat down and, uh, she told me that if she ever was in a situation like this, she didn't want the machines to keep her alive. She wanted us to pull the plug. And if God took her, God took her. Uh, my mother was fairly religious. 
Um, so that was a decision that we made. And ultimately it was, it was a decision that I made and I told the doctor not to revive if we pulled her off the vent and she passed away and she, you know, we knew she wasn't going to last. And when they pulled her off the vent, she passed away. And for a very long time, that was a decision that I had to live with. Um, you know, it was my decision that killed my mother. And that left me with a lot of depression. And the problem was at the time that all this was happening, I didn't have a, ch a chance to grieve. Because after that happened, we had to make the funeral arrangements and we had to get all that stuff ready and, and go out, go and do the funeral and, and all that. So I never had a chance to really grieve myself. And, and I held all that in and it sort of built up over time. And, you know, it, it kind of left me with some emotional scars over the course of the next seven years or so until I was finally kind of forced to deal with it. Um, so from a depression standpoint, I did isolate myself from it. Um, and it, you know, it, I bear the scars of that too, because I think a lot of that um, isolation, that self-imposed isolation is sort of what caused some of the issues that I have today with Sam and, and other people that, you know, I allowed it to de allow the deterioration of those relationships. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely something to be cognizant of. Yeah. And, um, unlike you, I didn't have control over Fluffer's death. Right. I mean, I was only seven. I couldn't really say if I wanted her to live or if I wanted her to die. You two had to decide that for yourself. Well, and really, it didn't come down to a, li a life or death, a live or not live situation. It was, she was going to pass. Yeah. And she was suffering in the condition that she was in. So the decision was to end the suffering or let her pass naturally, suffer and pass naturally. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, she had a curable disease that if we paid a lot of money and, and paid a vet to do tests and stuff like that, that we'd cure. Yeah. She wasn't going to survive yeah. and we didn't want to see her suffer anymore. So that was kind of what, what drove that decision. Yeah. And even though I didn't have control over, over that decision, I definitely think I felt the same way as you did. I like, as you said earlier, I basically, I basically kept to myself, or in this case, isolated myself. Yeah. It wasn't until one day that I just couldn't handle it anymore. But yeah. I definitely think after that, I, I definitely felt calmer on the matter, and I've. Well, and that brings us to the next step. Um, so the next stage that they have here is the upward turn. At this point, the stages of grief like anger and pain have died down and you're left in a more calm and relaxed state, which leads to reconstruction and working through. You can begin to put the pieces of your life back together and carry forward, which ultimately leads to the final stage, which is acceptance and hope. This is a very gradual acceptance of the new way of life and a feeling of possibility in the future. So you go through all these very powerful um, emotions early on where you feel like you're helpless. You don't have any control over the situation. And then you gradually work through these stages of grief as time wears on and you start to cope with them. And sometimes that coping involves talking to other people. Um, sometimes it just, it takes time and you finally get to that acceptance point where you have some hope moving forward. Yeah, I can definitely say after the whole breakdown that day, I had definitely learned to accept Fluffer's death. I mean, I basically isolated myself for a good amount of time and... It eventually seemed time to move on. Of course, mentioning about her still makes me shed a couple of tears, but yeah, I've definitely gotten better over the years after what I used to be. 
Well, and and we'll talk about that in the next segment about the the six basic principles of how to grieve because there is really a process associated with it. So the, the first principle really is that grieving is a natural reaction to death or loss. Everyone grieves. You know, whether it's your pet passing away, your grandmother passing away, losing a job, going through a divorce, grieving is natural. Any kind of loss is natural. Um, and each experience is unique. And that's, that's the one thing. Like a lot of times you'll talk to counselors at school or you may talk to some uh, professional psychiatrists or psychologists and they'll try to help you with your grief. There isn't you know, a cookbook on how to deal with grief. It doesn't, one technique doesn't work for everybody. Everyone's grief is unique. The situation, the personality, the relationship. Um, so if you grieve differently than someone else, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you grieve the way that you need to in order to cope. So there's no right or wrong way. Yep. Um, and every loss itself is experienced differently. Like uh, Fluffer passing away had a different effect on you than it did on myself or mommy. Um, even the other, the younger cats, you know, they went through a grieving process too. We don't, can't really begin to understand it, but they did act differently around her. Just like they kind of act differently around um, Dorian because they realize that Dorian's getting older and Dorian's not playful. Uh, and she's a little cranky. So, you know, if Dorian or when Dorian does pass, you know, the, the cats are going to grieve too. And we kind of have to be there for the cats. And, and I think that shared grief is really what helps us get through things more than anything else. Um, because grieving is influenced by a number of different things. So the social support systems that we have available, for instance, your family, your friends, your community. Like when my dad passed away, my dad had uh, was diagnosed with cancer my junior year in high school. And he passed away when I was a senior. And that was another one where I was very isolated, you know, having a terminal diagnosis. We knew he was going to pass away. He wasn't going to live. So you try to do what you can to spend as much time with the, the loved one as you can. And uh, when he did pass away, uh, to my surprise, when we were walking out of the church from the funeral, two of my best friends from high school had called, had taken off that day from school so that they could be there at the funeral. And, and like I kept it together the whole time through the ceremony and everything and, and you know, because they did a full mass and everything for my dad. And when we walked out and I saw the two of them, that's when it, started to hit me, you know, the reality of the situation. Um, but the circumstances of the loss, you know, was it a, was it a quick loss? You know, did the loved one die suddenly or was it a long drawn out illness that affects the grieving process too? You know, my dad, it was a long drawn out experience. My mom, it was, it was very sudden, you know, she wound up getting sick, you know, was unresponsive, went into the hospital and a week or so later, you know, she had passed away. So it was like one was this build up to grief and the other one was the sudden onrush of grief and you handle those very differently. Yeah. Um, like with Fluffer, we kind of knew she was sick and not doing well. So we, we kind of had this build up to it, but nothing ever really prepares you for it though. Yeah. I mean, like even like I didn't know, if, I knew Fluffer was old. But I didn't know she died like that. I didn't know. Sorry. Well, it's okay. It's a difficult topic, sweetheart. Yeah, I didn't know she was diagnosed with a knowing. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, let's face it. You were seven at the time. So your concept of death is very different at seven than it is now at 12 or 13. Yeah. So... There's very little in your life that's that permanent at that age, right? Yeah. Uh, you didn't have a chance to really even learn or understand what 
what death was and you get hit with it. You know, same thing happened to me. I was probably your age, maybe a little bit younger when my grandmother passed away and it was my grandmother on my mom's side and she was in her early nineties. So she was pretty old. Um, and like she was frail, but you know, to a 10 year old, anyone over 50 is frail, right? You know, you're old when you hit, when you hit 50 at that point, at least, you know, when I was that age, but she never seemed sick, like deathly sick. And when she passed away, it came as a shock to me and I had a very weird reaction to it. So as a kid, we all lived together. My mom, my dad, my three brothers and I, and my grandmother lived with us. And my mom and dad had one room. So when you, when you came up the stairs, you came up, the bathroom was, was at the head of the stairs. And then you came around a banister and you had the three bedrooms around the banister. So my mom and dad had the first bedroom. My brothers and I had the middle one and my grandmother had the, the last one. It was the smallest one. And I had a very weird reaction where I was afraid to go into the room. And I don't, to this day, I don't know why. I don't think I understood why then, but like, I knew she died in that room and just the idea of death being in that room, I think was something that scared me because I didn't understand it. I didn't know why she died. I didn't know what caused her to die. And, and I don't know, maybe part of me was afraid that it was something in that room that caused her to die. But like I was terrified going into my room and I'd run into my room real quick so I didn't have to spend a lot of time going past her door. And uh, it wasn't until years later that I, I even realized I was conscious of it because at the time, I don't even think I realized it. Um, but it, it again, it's how you grieve. It's how you deal with that. Um, so the level of involvement in the process also determines how you grieve. You know, the one recurring thing that you seem to say is you, you didn't have a say in what happened with Fluffer. And a lot of times you don't. And, and I think sometimes that's for the better. You know, I had a lot of say in, in how my mom died and, and that had long lasting effects on me. So. You know, you feel powerless on one hand and you feel guilt ridden on the other. So I'm sure there's a happy medium in between somewhere there. Yeah. And the emotional and developmental age of the person plays a factor too. You'll deal with grief one way at age seven because you're not emotionally developed enough to understand the concepts than you would if you dealt with it now. Now you're more mature. You have a better understanding of it. Sadly, you've gone through it now. So there is that level of experience. Yeah. But as a seven-year-old, you're just not equipped to deal with it. Mm, I can definitely say that I think age seven was the time I actually experienced death the most. I mean, Grammy died that that year. Fluffer died. And I think even my um, great-uncle Mickey died that year. Uh, it was around that time frame. I don't know if it, how close it was. Yeah, I can say around those that age, that was like the main part of, like that's when I really fully learned about death. And of course, as a seven year old, I didn't really understand it. Yeah, that's a tough time to to be handed that. You know, I mean, there's a like we we didn't expect a lot from you though, but just having that circumstance thrust upon you can have a lasting effect. And, and clearly, you know, it has. So, and, and the last point here is that grief is ongoing. It's not, it's not a cold. You don't get over it. You know, that loss is always there. Um, so you're always finding different ways to deal with it. Um, and you, that's, again, that's the important thing is that you do have to deal with it. The one thing that I learned after my mother passed away was I didn't deal with it. You know, I pushed it aside and I, and I tucked it away in the corner and I, I locked it away in this little emotional box here and I ignored it. 
And it's one of those things where it just, it doesn't stay, you know, it continues to build and it continues to grow. And, uh, and eventually it, it bursts out of that box and it becomes overwhelming. Um, whereas if you deal with it as it happens and you continue to deal with it, it doesn't make it easier, but it makes it manageable, you know? So, so we'll come back and we'll talk about how to help a grieving teenager. So one of the recurring themes in the research that I did is that grieving teenagers still want to be normal, what they consider normal. Adolescence is a time when most teens just want to fit in. So when a tragedy sets a teen apart, it's all the harder. And I can speak from experience with that because when my father passed away, my senior year, like you don't, that's not information that you can withhold, right? So everyone at school knew it and everyone at school immediately treats you differently. And it's not always for the best. Like it certainly doesn't help the grieving process. Everybody wants to express their condolences, but you kind of just want to be left alone. You want to sort of, at least I did, I wanted to deal with it on my own. Um, so every time someone would come up to me and express their condolences, it was like they were ripping a scab off of a wound that just started to heal, you know, and it doesn't let you feel normal. Now, how did you feel? I mean, you had some, um, difficulty dealing with the emotions when you were at camp and in school. How did that make you feel in the eyes of the other kids? I mean, I can definitely say if I ever mentioned it, they would definitely try to help me, but let's just say the repeating thing that happened the day I had the breakdown, like the fact that people just kept mentioning it, I just don't think it really helped. Yeah, and it usually doesn't, And but... The thing is that the people will see that you're upset and they'll want to talk about it. And it's human instinct to get you to talk about something like that. I mean, I understand the concern, but it's just like at that point in your life, you just at that point, you just want to be left alone. And the fact that people are mentioning it up again just causes the pain to get stronger. And you probably will. And it'll probably leave an even longer lasting mark. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Friends are important to a grieving teenager. Yeah. Um, adolescence is also a time when peers play a starring role, much more so than in early childhood. So it should come as no surprise that when it comes to teenage grief and loss, teens may learn lean more on peers than on grown-ups. And I think the important thing here is that your friends know you, Right. So your friends are generally going to be the ones that see that you're upset and they're, they're going to be the ones that console you, not by expressing their sympathy for you, but by sort of grounding you and bringing you back down to the things in life that they know you enjoy. Um, you know, if you want someone to talk to, you can talk to them, but they're not going to be the type of people that are that are trying to pressure you to talk to them. Yeah. It's like, like if you like talk to a, complete like a kid from school you don't really know too much they're just gonna like keep asking questions about it where your friend will decide to just listen to your problems and just try to do their best to um better understand it like you know how some people say i understand well, sometimes you really don't. Like, if you've never had a pet and never experienced loss of a pet, you really don't understand what it's like. And yeah. I definitely think that's that makes you even more sad when people say that. Your friends don't really do that. They're just, like, they help with, like, they make you, they take your mind off the subject, which I definitely think is the best right. part. Right, they'll distract you, they'll, they'll, they'll occupy your, your, your thoughts elsewhere so you're not dwelling on it. Yeah, I can definitely say whenever I talk to my friends and they're ever feeling sad, I don't 
pressure them to tell me about it. Like, if they want, I always assure them, if they want to tell me about it, they can. And if they do, I make sure I don't pressure them to answer some questions. I just listen to them, I nod my head, and I make sure I'm listening to a clear definition of what their problems are. And that leads us into the next suggestion here is let a grieving teenager take the lead. It's not helpful to try and direct what a grieving teenager should do, say, or feel. Rather, follow their lead. Listen to them. Let them talk. Let them get it out. You know, if you are trying to talk about something other than that loss, then, you know, let's go with that. Let's talk about what's in the news or, or what we did in class today or, you know, Whatever it is that that person who's grieving wants to talk about, let them take the lead on that and then follow with them. But listen. I think listening is the most important thing. Yeah, like there's always that one thing where whenever a teenager has a problem, someone would ask them what's wrong, and then one of the most common responses, if they didn't want to say it, they'd be, I don't want to talk about it. Some, some people would just keep nagging at them to tell them, but, like, your friends and the people who care about you most will give you um, time and space if you need it. Like, if they would ask if you wanted to talk about, like, some other kind of topic or they would just take your mind off the subject anyway and it would make you feel better. And I definitely think that's the best part of having friends and family and just peers who can, can accept you. Yeah. And the next suggestion they have is kind of a cautionary one. They say, be careful with your language. Uh, it's hard to know what to say to a grieving teenager and what not to say. You know, don't say things will get better or you should be over this by now or something like that because that's not going to help. Yeah, um, like definitely the you, you should be over this by now, that ain't going to help. That's right. just going to make it even worse. And like, as I said before, the I understand you, that's like... It's almost patronizing you. Yeah, it's like... Like, well, okay, you don't. I I know you might want to understand what I'm going through right now, but you don't. And it's because of what we said earlier is that it's a unique experience. You may have experienced loss, but everyone experiences loss differently. So instead of understanding, why don't you listen to me? Listen to, let me explain to you how I feel. And just, just let me unload, right? Yeah, it's like... Like whenever I monologue, like when people ask me things and I just feel like I need to unload a bunch of stuff on them. Yep. And it's like, the same thing when you're grieving, right? You know, I know when I was going through it and someone would say, I understand. And, it, you know, my first reaction is, you, what do you understand? Do you understand the loss? Do you understand the grief? Do you understand the guilt? What part of all of this really complicated experience do you understand? Yeah, and that's the thing. Grief and loss is like a complicated experience. You can have different types of loss. You can be grieving at different times. You can have different yeah. types of grief. And you can have different types of grief at different times. And, like, everyone takes it differently. There's only there's rarely any one person who will actually understand everything you're going through. Unless they're, like, basically the same person as you, went through the same loss at the same time as you did, and had the same stages. But even then, like, if you were, were related to each other and you were the same age, they still wouldn't really understand you because you go through different stages of grief. Like, some people can start with the anger, bef the, the sadness before they take the anger step. Like, or maybe they don't even have those steps and they just have the depression step. Like, they can skip steps. They can put the steps out of order. They can even have completely different steps that we haven't even discussed. Right. Well, and like you, I, I even go back to when my mom passed away and it's like, all right, well, she had four boys. Each of those four boys grieved differently because the relationship they had with her was different. Yeah. Like even the relationship with the person who had died or the relationship with the type of loss or problem you've been been experiencing everyone takes it differently depending on your relationship like you and like i had a really close relationship with fluffers she was with us before i was even born and to have her die when i was only seven just hurt me so bad i mean you and mommy basically expected this and even though like you mommy felt like complete sadness and probably still does now she didn't take it as hard as i did right well, and again, it was because 
This wasn't the first pet of hers that had passed away, so she's had the experience. Yeah, and that was like the first time I ever experienced death. I think she died before I, um, before Grammy, or maybe they died around the same age. I don't really know. Yeah, and it was just you weren't equipped for it. Yeah. So the next suggestion that they have for helping a, a grieving teen is to give them something to do. Uh, this can include helping to memorialize the family member or friend, for example, you could make T-shirts in memory of a deceased relative or, you know, that something to do could be something completely unrelated to the death of that person. You know, someone dies and you're sad, well, let's go out to the mall and let's go shopping. Let's go buy new clothes or let's go to the movies or let's go out to Dave and Buster's or whatever your your nearby entertainment place is and let's let's... Go blow off some steam. Let's have a little bit of fun. Let's take our mind off of it because it's draining. It's, it's emotionally and physically draining to endure that grief. So anything that can take you away from that for even a little while is a chance to re-energize and give you the strength you need to continue to deal with it. Okay, so I think the things with Fluffer, we definitely had the little ceremonial grave we actually like we actually had a box and we put duct tape on it and we wrote things on it put her body in and made sure to tape it and then we had a little burial ceremony and can i also say i think there was another stage of grief i actually might have felt and i think this was about i don't know a year afterwards i started using my I started using make believe, like pretending she was still alive. Like right. I remember sometimes coming home from from school with mommy and imagining Fluffer's um Fluffer's like body roaming around. I used my imagination for it and like yeah. that's a whole nother stage of grief. Like you use make believe to hopefully have the person you still And that's how children with. cope. And I did something similar. Actually, when my grandmother passed away, because my grandmother um, was my care my caregiver for a while, because my mom would go out and clean houses and work, and my grandmother would babysit. And what was interesting is my grandmother was Lithuanian and didn't speak English, and um, I didn't speak Lithuanian, so it made communications very interesting. Um, but her and I got along great; we were very close. And when she had passed away, I don't know if my parents bought me this little stuffed animal, it was a little bunny, or I had it or what, but in my brain, that little stuffed animal took on my grandmother's personality. And I would sleep with it at night, I would talk to it, and that was largely how I would get through it with my own imagination. And and that's something that's very typical of children who are under the age of 10. Yeah, I think I actually went through that kind of stage too. Like, I have this one uh, gray little stuffed animal cat. I actually still have it in my room now. Um, mommy gave it to me shortly after Fluffer's passing. And, oh. We have a, a guest with us today. Our, uh, our, our uh, elder cat... Uh, Dorian is wandering around in the studio with us today. Yeah. Um, as I was saying, Mommy had given it to me shortly after Fluffer's passing, saying that I could use it as a representative of Fluffer. And I kept it on my bed every night. I would. I think I actually slept with it a few times, like in my arms, and I would just keep it with me. And occasionally I would talk to it. I would imagine it was actually the real Fluffer. Right. Of course... It never really was, but I had my imagination when I was like. And it, it's and one of those things that it's a comic technique to help you process those emotions and have them in embodied in a physical thing. Yeah. So and and it works up to a certain age and and beyond that there are other techniques that you you know you learn. Yeah. So the last thing that we wanted to talk about here as a, a suggestion for helping. Uh, teens cope you want to let her out now 
Okay, I'll she's, be right back. She's guys. very confused. I'll be, I will, I'll be right back. That's fine. You can still hear me though. So the the last thing that we had to talk about here was be honest. So this is uh, particularly important in the event of an anticipated death, such as a terminal illness, uh, sometimes out of a desire to protect our children, we're not completely honest about that situation, and I'm guilty of that myself. All right, sweetie, just leave the door open. You can just sit down now. Oh, no, no, no. She'll, she'll figure it out. Just sit down. Um... The cat's blind, by the way, for the audience, so she has difficulty finding her way sometimes. Yeah. But she's persistent, so she always does get where she wants to go. Yeah. So, be honest. And that was one of the things that I appreciated with my parents. When my dad was sick, they were very honest with me. Uh -huh. um, I still remember the day that that I found out that he had cancer and I walked in the house and they told me and, and like in my initial reaction was just shock. Like, like how do I react to this? You know? Yeah. And I think like for any major illness, that's basically the main thing. Like if you find out you or a loved one has a major illness, for instance, cancer, like that's the main thing now. Like yeah. you, the initial reaction is just shock and disbelief. Yeah. But honesty, you know, be honest with the situation, um, be honest with what the next steps are. Yeah, it's like similar with like using the right language for people who like are t trying to talk out with their teens. Like use language that you know, like don't use like, oh, I've been there, that kind of thing. Right. Because you won't be there. Like, you But the other key thing to honesty here. Now, these, these are tips on how to help teens, but this is a tip for teens, too, is you need to be honest. If mm -hmm. someone asks you if you're okay, it's all right to say, no, I'm not, but I don't want to talk about it right now. You don't want to say, yes, I'm fine, when you're really not fine. Yeah, and that's also a problem with a related thing with bullying. I remember watching a video where, like, the one kid's being bullied and he doesn't say anything until he just can't take it anymore. And if he said it from the beginning, it would have helped. And I always thought, like, I'd be the same way. But having the problems, having my own um, existential problems, I realized I didn't really want to talk to people until we started the podcast and I started becoming more honest and open with you guys. Right. Honest doesn't mean you have to talk about it if yeah. you're not ready. Honest means you have to acknowledge it because the more people ask you if you're okay and the more you say, yes, I am, the less apt you are to actually recognize that you're not okay and deal with it. Yeah. It's one of, it's like the old adage. You could tell a lie often enough. Eventually somebody believes it. Yeah. And we don't want you to think that you're okay if you're not. So when someone asks you if you're okay, the best response is no, I'm, I'm really not, but I'm not ready to talk about it just yet. Yeah. Uh, and at that point in time, most people most adults will sort of back off and give you the space the fact that you acknowledge that you're not okay is the most important thing you know i would remember when i used to th always think negative and just didn't want to do really anything with people and whenever they would say I, they were okay i would always get frustrated at them because they would just i just couldn't take it i would always say i'm fine i'm okay i'm good when in reality i really wasn't yeah i could definitely say like, before everything, I definitely wasn't honest with myself. That's good. And that's important to get to that point. And it's tough sometimes. Yeah. So let's come back and we'll get your closing remarks and your shout-outs. Okay. Go for closing remarks. Okay. So for everyone in the audience, not just, te not just the teens, but also any adults, just... Know that we are all going to experience a loss at some point. I can't exactly say what kind of loss. Like, as we said before, everyone experiences loss differently. Like, you might experience the steps we've laid out, but you might experience even new steps. You might experience them in a different order, and you might not experience some of the steps at all. 
But no matter what, we can always say we will all experience some sort form of loss or grief, whether it's the loss of a job opportunity, being fired from your job, the loss of a pet or a loved one, or um, a divorce or a failed relationship. Just no loss. It Grief and loss is common, and there's no right or wrong way to deal with it. I mean, there are wrong ways that you shouldn't deal with it but there's no one right way it's basically like a puzzle sometimes like there's different ways you can take to get there and in the end they can all lead up to one good result okay any shout outs today um i guess i'll give a shout out to all of our the members of our family who have sadly passed away um, they have definitely taught, I can definitely say all the, uh, loss I've been, all of the losses I've been, um, able to learn definitely helped me better understand what death and loss and grief was. Okay. Good, uh, shout out there. Good, uh, closing remarks. I think that's going to do it for us for this week. Alrighty. Uh, check us out on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash insights into things our websites insights into things.com you can hit us on facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast you can email us at comments at insights into things and all the other different things that we have yeah and don't forget to check out our newest our other podcast insights and entertainment and our newest one insights in tomorrow which we should be filming a new one we should be filming a new episode soon we will be filming a new episode of insights into tomorrow on sunday this sunday as a matter of fact Ooh. sunday afternoon uh starting sometime around two and insights in entertainment tomorrow live uh probably around nine in the morning mm. and everything as usual goes live monday at eight on youtube normally on youtube on uh buzzsprout you can get the po audio version of the podcast at uh podcast.insightsintoteens.com and i think that's it for us already we are done another one in the books bye everyone bye